Hello, my name is Amit Power and welcome to my updated video on the Paramedian Sagittal approach to the thoracic paravertebral block. We're going to start off with some anatomy here and you can see we've removed the skin, the soft tissue and the muscle and we're now exposing the uh, vertebral bodies the, with the associated spinous process, lamina and transverse process and their articulation with the ribs. We could also see the pleura, the superior costotransverse transverse ligament and the intercostal nerve in the paravertebral space. So let's zoom in now. We're going to zoom in over a spinous process. Now we can see the two transverse processes of interest. There's a superior costo transverse ligament and deep to that is the intercostal nerve in the paravertebral space. A true paramedian paravertebral block would involve coming in uh, over the chordal transverse process but I like to oblique it slightly and I'll show you that video here. We're having that slightly oblique approach into the paravertebral space. So why use a paramedian sagittal approach? Well, often it's the technique that's often taught the most, so it makes sense for us to go over some of that anatomy. The other thing is that many people will already be performing an erectus spinae plane block, so this seems like a natural progression from that. The other advantage when you're doing a paramedian sagittal approach to paravertebral space is you can watch real-time multi-level pleura drop, so you can get an idea of how many spaces are involved in real time. The other advantage, of course, is that you're not needling towards the neural axis, but parallel to it. So another potential safety aspect. So let's start off with a high frequency linear probe lateral on the chest wall, and we slide our probe towards the midline. And as we slide our probe towards the midline, we see the bony outline of the rib change to become a more uh, rectangular or tombstone-like appearance of the transverse processes. The other thing that happened as we went from lateral to medial is the erectus spinae muscle bulk got much larger and much more visible. But you'll notice the pleura is not that clearly visible when you're truly paramedian sagittal. So let's add some highlights on here. So here's the adipose, here's the trapezius, um, on what would have been the rhomboid muscle, but I put it in small letters because we're actually scanning just below where rhomboid has ended here. Uh, and then we've got that large erectus spinae muscle bulk. Um, we've then got the transverse process shadow, which is overlying the rib. Uh, and then we have the intertransverse tissue complex. And deep to all of that, you've got the pleura. So that's your initial view. Now, in order to get a better view of the pleura, if you're going to perform a paravertebral block, you've got two options. You can either remain truly paramedian sagittal and just tilt the beam of the ultrasound ever so slightly laterally to make sure you get a view of that pleura. That's option one, but I'm going to show you to do something else. I'm going to show you um, how to pivot the ultrasound probe on the Keflad aspect and direct the chordal part of the probe laterally as such. So here we go, I'm going to pivot on the Keflad part of the probe, direct the chordal part of the, pr the probe out laterally, so we're now scanning over a rib. And by doing that, I've now got a view here where we've suddenly opened up the paravertebral space. You can see the supercosto transverse ligament uh, and the pleura, but we've got a lower chordad bony impedance, so when a needle comes in, it's a lot easier. So let's add some color overlay. This is the paramedian sagittal oblique view. Uh, so here we've got the adipose. Here are our paraspinal muscles. And now you'll see the cephalad bony shadow is formed by the transverse process overlying the rib. But because we've obliqued the chordal part of the probe, we're now scanning over the rib. And we've managed to open up that access to the paravertebral space. There's a pleura deep to it, and there's that lovely superior costo transverse ligament with a large paravertebral space deep to it. So now we can needle in plane from chordal to cephalad and get into that space. So here's that needle coming in from chordal to cephalad crossing the superior costo transverse ligament and injecting local anesthetic deep to it to get that lovely pleural drop. So let's see what that looks like in real life. So here is a, a patient. The right hand side of the screen is cephalad, The left hand side of the screen is chordad, And this needle is coming in plane. Uh, so I'm going to play the video in a second and you'll see that initial seeker solution which is demonstrating that the needle tip is just crossed the superior costo transverse ligament. There you go. In fact, you can see the needle tip is just about to breach that superior costo transverse ligament, but the pleura has dropped. And this is one of the things that can happen. We now know that the superior costo transverse ligament isn't completely impervious. So if you're right at the ligament or just behind of it, some of that local anesthetic can cross the other side into the paravertebral space. And here you've got a lovely depression of pleura. The next phase would be to advance that needle uh, a little bit further into the space, and I generally tend to use a volume of 20 to 25 mils per hemithorax. 
I know what you're going to say that that was too quick. So let's watch a slightly slow down video here. Same orientation, right hand side of the screen is Kefalad, left hand side of the screen is Cordad. You can see that slightly different appearance of the bones now. The right is the transverse process and the left bony um, landmark is a rib. So we're going to use some hydrolocation now. So that needle is in the intertransverse tissue complex, injects in local anesthetic, not quite there. So we're going to advance a bit further. But I'm concerned that that needle tip is going to dive under the shadow of that transverse process. So I'm going to inject local anesthetic here. I'm not quite there. So I'm going to bring the needle back and re-angle. Uh, and now we're in that paravertebral space. Let's see what happens. There we've got that pleural depression. So that's the block. We're going to finish up on some tips now. So I like to use a linear probe for most of my paramedian sagittal paravertebral blocks. But in some occasions, you do need to use a curved array probe. I think the beauty about this technique is you can perform it with the patient in the sitting, the lateral or the prone position. I like to use the prone position. I find that a much more stable surface to have the patient in. Um, I like to needle in plane, but of course some of you would like to needle out plane. Both uh, are appropriate depending upon what you're used to. But whatever you do, do use hydrolocation with a seeker solution to make sure you don't lose sight of the needle tip. You haven't inadvertently advanced too far without realizing it, and more importantly, so that you have enough volume of local anesthetic to inject once you get to the paravertebral space. The last note of caution, often to generate this image, you need to use a little bit of probe tilt and there's a bit of probe rotation involved. So bear that in mind when you're needling in plane, because often if your needle is not at 90 degrees to the skin, you might need to insert your needle slightly off center in order to see it in plane. I hope you found this video useful. I'd like to finish up by thanking Dr. Shelley Lee, Dr. Mick Kerr and Courtney Andrews for their help in producing this video.